Today, I'm going to talk a little bit on the, on the reason why we are here, why we do what we do, because I feel like, you know, crypto in general has kind of lost its way a little bit uh, in to getting too much into the weeds and really forgetting the roots uh, of what created this industry. So looking back into uh, the history of, of computing, uh, reviewing the current state, and really showing where we're going, right? So this talk is not too much on the AI side, although I'll touch a little bit, but really on the general framework, general principles, how, uh, how we got to doing what we're doing. My name is Greg. I'm the CEO for Overclock Labs. I'm the core contributor to Akash Network. Uh, been a programmer for most of my life, and prior to Akash, I founded a company called Angel Hack. Uh, I'm an open source developer. Uh, been uh, ranked as one of the top developers in the world for code I've written, libraries I've published. Um, you've been ranked as number four on, uh, on GitHub, Golang trending uh, category. Uh, I was the only human being here, I believe, in between uh, Mozilla and Google. Um, a lot of the code I wrote is uh, now part of NVIDIA, uh, part of US Department of Defense, uh, part of AWS. A lot of that source code, which we originally wrote for Akash, uh, it's kind of incredible to see how it comes back to actually uh, us repurposing some of the NVIDIA code as well. So it's like, gets into the cyclical uh, dependency. Anyway, the talk today, the outline really is about, you know, if, if you really think about how the birth of the internet uh, was born out of decentralization and the need for decentralization, and that transition to, to what we have, which is uh, extremely centralized, right? Um, it really began with, with mainframes, right? If you come, come down to the first time computation was used at scale, mainframes were you have to go to the system, literally borrow time from the system in order to use the system, which led to innovation in personal computing, uh, more distributed computing in the hands of people that really created the internet on the foundation of decentralization. Connecting these individual devices in a hive network, sharing intelligence, and uh, removing the need for a centralized coordinated system to communicate, it gave birth to the internet uh, based on decentralized principles. And historically, decentralization is what really spun uh, the innovation and the accessibility that we have today. Uh, but eventually, somehow, <laughs> the centralization came with large hyperscalers and uh, large uh, data centers, essentially filling the need for coordination, right? So as devices got a lot more smaller, a uh, lot less powerful, the, the, the new layer called the cloud kind of uh, came around, consolidating this power into few companies, really, uh, companies, we call them hyperscalers today, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft's the world. Uh, if you look at the IT spend, uh, over close to 70% of all the IT spend is spent by four companies. So that tells you the kind of control these companies have. It kind of gives you an idea how the vendors to these companies are optimizing hardware to serve the hyperscalers and not really to serve the general public or, 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 or the common good, right? And that presents a few challenges when it comes to sovereignty because it's no longer the case when you have smaller data centers uh, that can place large orders uh, into those vendors because a lot of the vendors are really optimizing for, for hyperscalers. And that gap is actually widening quite a lot. It's very concerning. And if you look at uh, the gated access to the resources, there was a story on Semaphore. Uh, I mean, this is a very, very widely known uh, fact that if you are doing any AI development, it's extremely hard to get access to this accelerated computing, namely chips like H100s or A100s. Even likes of Elon Musk, who is famously known for saying, Getting access to GPUs is harder than getting access to drugs, even though that's a, that's a low bar in San Francisco. But that's a reality, right? If you try to get any decent amount of compute uh, to do AI training or inference, it's, you'll find it extremely difficult. I mean, until recently, it was like impossible 
to get it on uh, on, on centralized uh, servers like Amazon's of the world. I mean, they will select who gets compute based on the profit margins they're able to get. And if we look at the costs, right? I mean, uh, the costs are getting out of control. Over 50% of every single penny we spend on online services goes to one of the three cloud providers. All of us pay a cloud tax without knowing who, the, who we're paying the tax to. So your Netflix of the world, your Googles of the world, your Asanas of the Palantir, even Department of Defense, which uses Palantir, pays a cloud tax, right? So you can see here, there's this invisible opaque layer that we all have to pay into to for, for society to function. And it's a, is a and, and Anderson Horowitz did this study, it's called the Trillion Dollar Paradox. Uh, it's a fascinating study, highly recommend folks to go through that. Um, and, and, and the worst part is reliability. I mean, how many of you heard of CrowdStrike or have been impacted by CrowdStrike? Quick show of hands here. I never heard about the company until recently. Uh, CrowdStrike happens to be this company that provides critical software for airlines and a whole lot of uh, critical infrastructure services. That going down literally made thousands of people cancel their flights without food, without accommodation. Delta alone had to cancel 7,000 flights because somebody pushed bad code to production. It's not a state actor attacking our infrastructure, just somebody pushed bad code. That's how opaque this cloud is. And none of us know what's happening, right? I mean, this is not open. This is controlled by a few people, and somehow this code got pushed through. You can imagine what a scenario tomorrow where a serious state actor is trying to attack our infrastructure. What is that going to look like, right? And that is the current situation we have. And if you look at the industry practices, and cloud is known for stifling innovation. They built these competitive moats, which makes it extremely hard for newcomers to come and participate in this economy. Uh, it reminds very well. I mean, it reminds you of the railroads, uh, uh, you know, encroachment on, on on stifling innovation, or in from the 1800s or late 1800s to to pre World War One. Uh, cloud is exactly in that position, and right now, U.S. government is actually investigating a lot of these cloud companies for antitrust. Um, you know, a lot of lawsuits uh, by open source companies on the cloud companies because they tend to steal open source software uh, and their business models, right? Um, I mean, it's, it's very obvious the centralization leads to higher costs, uh, less access, and they're you know, stifling our innovation. And the economic, the economic inefficiencies and escalating costs is a real problem that we need to pay attention to. Um, and what are the risks of going down this path? What are the risks of hyper-concentration of power? The real risk is us as a society going back to feudalism. I call this digital feudalism. There was a time in history that few people had most power in Europe, and peasants had to depend on these people for accessing basic things like food and water. And that is a future where we are, we are facing right now. Uh, and the future is bleak, where a corporation or a business dictates who gets to do AI. It dictates the rash, I mean, rations of resources uh, to use AI, and we're kind of seeing that right now, right? You're seeing Amazons and Googles of the world rationing computing power, rationing what we call the spice, you know, but the spice must flow, right? So, and the industry sentiment is obviously very clear. People want solutions. And that's where we have. We have a new era of innovation. We have a new era of decentralization uh, in the cloud industry. And, uh, and why? Because we believe compute should be a public utility. Compute should be as free as the air we breathe and water we drink. And that's the future we're all building towards. Uh, what that means is restoration of sovereignty. We need to have control over our data, we need to have control over compute, and we need to empower communities uh, rather than corporations uh, to drive this technological progress. Um, instead of few people uh, having access to this compute, the access should be ungated, access should be open, access should be public, and, and efficient, right? Uh, the margins, if you look at Amazon's of the world, Amazon is, the Amazon Web Services unit is alone a, a, a trillion dollar business for Amazon, right? And then profit margins are over 60%, and that's not okay. Uh, when you, you can't 
have enormously profitable uh, layer, and you call it a public utility. For example, the cost, if you look at uh, decentralized systems like Akash, it's 80% cheaper than what you would otherwise pay on Amazon. And that's because there's compute available everywhere. You don't have to depend on you know, these hyperscalers to drive, uh, that, uh, that depend on margins to drive their business. And reliability, I mean, we don't have to rely on these opaque services. Open source systems are very capable. In a case like Akash, we have been live for about four years, and there hasn't been a single time the network went down or slowed down. It's always available, it's always live, and that's possible because it's open source. People are looking at the source code all the time. People are pushing updates all the time. It's decentralized. There's not a single system that controls uh, the entire network, but rather a distributed nodes that all coordinate uh, together that control the, uh, or that run the network, right? You have this new era of innovation that really looks like this, right? This is a, a new industry called DPIN, or, this, uh, or Decentralized Physical uh, infra Infrastructure Networks. Um, Akash happens to be a category creator, and you have all layers of cloud infrastructure, all the way from general purpose compute, where Akash and you know, Flux and a whole lot of uh, uh, you know, players uh, are, 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 are innovating to storage networks like Filecoin, to machine learning networks like BitTensor. You have this new layer of infrastructure called DeepIn, and that's very live, that has product market fit, and that's growing really well. In a case like Akash, which I happen to be a core contributor of, Akash is the world's first decentralized super cloud that relies on a distributed network of cloud-capable clusters and leverages underutilized compute and offers that in a permissionally decentralized manner. Uh, the way it works at a higher level is the users uh, that require compute define what they want uh, in, a, uh, in a format called SDL, place their order on chain, and providers that can offer this, this compute bid on the workload in a reverse auction mechanism upon which the tenant selects the provider that they want to go with, uh, and a lease gets created, and execution uh, post-lease creation happens off-chain, whereas coordination and payments happen on-chain in a decentralized manner. Uh, the NVIDIA, I mean, the incredible ecosystem. NVIDIA happens to be a biggest user of Akash. In fact, uh, Akash is the only uh, crypto protocol NVIDIA uses. Uh, it's, Akash is integrated into NVIDIA products, and uh, incredible companies like, uh, we, you know, News Research, which happens to be a top tier uh, AI team uh, that's working on decentralized training, to University of Texas, to Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, you know, Akash has a, a, has a wide uh, ecosystem in the traditional AI world and also in the decentralized world. Some of, some of my favorite uh, happens to be uh, Venice AI, which is uh, a company uh, created by Eric Voorhees. Uh, and it's a privacy-optimized chat GPT replacement that runs on Akash, which I personally happen to use as well. Um, <coughs> the, sorry. Growth has been incredible. I mean, uh, this quarter alone, we saw a 50% growth in the leases that were created uh, from, from last quarter, and, uh, and that is uh, bound to increase this quarter as well. Uh, so before I leave, a question I really leave is uh, with you is as we stand in the crossroads of technological development today, the choice is really ours to continue down the path of, of, of centralization or to embrace decentralization and unlock a new era of uh, innovation and, and, and uh, empowerment. With that, I conclude. Thank you so much.